fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. It's 105 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. It's another action thriller day because we've got Mr. Joe Goldberg in the house. I'm in the house. I just came in the house with my arms full of tomatoes. It's that season, you know. Tomatoes. Well, that's not very action orientated. Here, you you're like grandma. Oh, you, you know those, those are. In, well, never I know if the tomato plants get a duty. You know, like a poo. No, it's that oh, season, yeah. man. Everybody's carrying tomatoes around in their neighbor's house. You're definitely like a grandma now. You know, I am. What kind I of am. action thriller CIA spy is that? It's the kind who picks tomatoes, goes in and takes a nap because he's worn himself out picking tomatoes. Yeah. yeah, you know, and the squirrel's winning. I know you've heard about it. <laughs> Don't let me talk about him. The squirrel is a ninja. <laughs> yes, I will not discuss my squirrel situation and my rabbit situation. That's where we need Eric because he's yeah. got the weapons. you got to call in the man that knows how to do yeah. this. Yeah, the body man. i got to call the him in. The body man care my is coming pest in. Issues. Yeah, there you go. Mr. Eric P. Bishop is here to solve Joe's issues. Well, thank you, Alan. I've just right. learned a good thing, too. If we ever want to take Joe out, we don't have to actually infiltrate his house. We just have to infiltrate his garden and inject his tomatoes. For it. This is perfect. <laughs> I've learned a lot. Yes, there's a, there's a plot line. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a Columbo. Just call the squirrel up. <laughs> squirrel has him contained, no problem. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not taking a whole lot to keep him going. That's right. Don't yeah. touch my vegetables, Al. Don't touch my vegetables. No. I only touch when I'm asked. <laughs> <laughs> and we continue on. So, Mr. Eric P. Bishop, so what are we talking about here? So now you wrote The Body Man, and uh, how did that come about? Let's start with that. Yeah, absolutely. I, l- I love telling the story. So uh, the, the title is what normally grabs people, and the funny thing about it uh, in that title is I was I was doing a job on a Friday night, You know, like you have to do when you have a family sometimes. You have to have an extra income, and I was doing a cleaning job. I was in between books. Um, I was working on finishing one up and kind of editing it, and I wanted a new story. So I got into that. I got into that office space one night and um, turned the alarm off. And I kind of had this thought run through my brain, and it was kind of a weird one. But the thought was, there's always someone who knows where the bodies are buried. That made me ponder what what was going on with my mind, of course. But I answered my own question: Who would know where the bodies were buried? Well, it would be the body man. That then took me in my brain to a story I had heard on the news. Um, that involved President Obama and a man named Reggie Love, who the media kind of dubbed the body man. And I kind of realized quickly that probably wouldn't be an exciting story since Reggie's job, from what I could gather, was mainly to hold the president's Blackberry and get him what he needed if they were out and about and set up basketball appointments and all that kind of stuff. So uh, my brain kind of said, well, what if the role of the bot, what if there was an actual role known as the body man within the White House, but what if that job was not to protect you know, be the, an assistant to the president or even protect the president, whatever that, that person's job was to protect the office of the presidency, um, even if that means from the current office holder. So that, that kind of got my mind running for about three hours while I cleaned. And uh, I can't say I got the full story in my brain, but I got a good concept of what it was going to become. And, you know, probably took me about, I don't think I started writing it for almost a year. Uh, thereabouts, I did a lot of research and planning and stuff, and and it took a while to write it. But that was uh that was kind of the formation of the body man. So how did how do you get into developing what kind of uh, character that body man is going to be, and 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 what kind of duties they're going to have? Because you don't really have someone you're following, um, or do you? Well, it's the house of mystery, Alan. I can't tell you if it's based on someone real or not. <laughs> you know, I can't can't reveal all my sources, Alan. Um, well, we know it's Joe, so yeah. You know. Just tell me, and I won't tell. I won't tell anybody. Yeah. You can believe me. Th- that's true. Joe is the vault, so he yes. he will he will die on the sword. Um, no, just a lot of um. I, 
what what my path everyone every, you know you talk to obviously you probably talk to a lot of writers and you know any writer you talk to is going to kind of have a maybe some core standards they follow but a lot of variety uh, so for me when i come up with a full th- concept or, or come up with an idea it normally starts with the title or the, a working title and then i just kind of build around that central story you know i normally spend months i've gone as long as spending a year a year and a half just Kind of going back in my brain or going in my notes that I keep of, okay, what do I want for a character? And I always start with pretty much a, a main storyline, but then I start building my protagonist. So for, for the body man, it was, what would this person, you know, what would their official duties be like? I researched as much as I could. I researched a lot of Secret Service because I wanted this person to kind of come from that realm of the Secret Service world. I wanted them to have the knowledge of protection but not necessarily have that be their, you know, their primary job responsibility at that time. The, the way that they were protecting or would be protecting that role is protecting the actual um, concept of what the presidency is. And, and that's something that I think, you know, we, we're talking offline about politics and just how crazy things can get. And at least from an American standpoint, I know there's lots of countries out there and most people obviously love their country as they should. But f- definitely for quite a long time now, well over 100 years, uh, the United States has been really a force out there in the world. And the presidency especially has, at least for quite a period of time, been seen as kind of the leader of the free world. And you get a lot of people in that office. They could, uh, Of course, they're probably all flawed and some very flawed. You know, what happens if you have a president that's going to besmirch the office, you know, really take that role down, which probably people would say is a common occurrence. Um, so, so that role is to keep that from occurring in Eric P. Bishop's world of the body man. When you cover a topic like that, when you, it, it, and being that it's so sensitive or it's a touchy issue nowadays, how do you, how do you address that without setting off half your audience? A very good question. So the first draft I did, and I won't say which way I went with the draft, but I had, I had some pretty, I have, I have a good group of beta readers. And I have some people that are really close to me, but they're also fortunately not not yes men. They're not sitting on my shoulders going, oh, that's the greatest thing I've ever read. They flat out tell me whether I hit the nail on the head or whether I just plain stink. Um, so one of the first passes I got from from one of one of my uh, people, I will say, is, uh, yeah, no, that's not going to fly. You got to tone the president down really over the top, really mimicking a current political leader, basically. So I had had to change a lot with the second draft and, and, and pull a lot of that out and, and make it more of a, a centrist type character where I'm not necessarily showing my hand, whether it's a, you know, a person on one side of the aisle or the other. Yeah, because you don't want to alienate half your office. You know, I want to my ultimate goal is to tell a good story. That's what I'm that's what gives me the joy. And that's why I do this. But absolutely up there, too, is I want to sell copies. So to, uh, to to tick off half of my audience would would be pretty stupid on my part. It's a fine line. Absolutely fine line. No, you're stupid. No, that's not a fine line. <laughs> that's true. Um, so I know you said this in your answer, and I, your first answer. I want to make sure I get it clear. You came up with a title. I do the same thing and kind of work around it. But at that point, do you build your character, or do you say, here's my plot, and the character will define themselves as I go along? What came, kind of what came first? Plot, storyline, or character? A uh, plot definitely came first. A uh, bl- plot did come. I, I, I knew. I knew before I got done cleaning that office that night. It was that Friday night. I knew the direction where I was going with the story. I I knew a very high level beginning, and I knew a fairly definitive end. And it didn't change. It didn't really change over the course of several years between the development and the actual writing and then rewrites. Um, so the characters, but then, then during that time though, once I kind of, you know, some people, and, uh, Joe, I think we've talked about this online, obviously there's, you know, there's the plotters, there's the pantsers. I, I most certainly, and when I first started writing in 2014, cause I wrote three books before the body man. So it was actually my fourth completed novel. It was just the first one to actually get, uh, someone willing to publish it. And when I first started, I was 100% a pantser. I flew by the seat of my pants. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And when I finished that first book called Vengeance, um, I couldn't believe no one wanted to buy it, which was crazy to me. And it was probably because I didn't know what I was doing. And so I I had to learn along the way to refine my processes. And I'm definitely not an outliner now, 
but I'm much more into spending time um, creating the world before I start writing. But I leave a lot of blank space in there. I know for some people, um, I, I've gotten to know Kyle Mills a little bit, who really um, brought Vince Flynn's character back to life after uh, after Vince um, untimely passing. You know, he he writes an outline that's probably a half to a third of a novel. There's so much detail and so much information there. So he can, I, I believe if I recall, you know, he gets up one morning and he'll be like, I'm going to write chapter 43 today. And he's got notes on what chapter 43 is and he writes it. And the next day or next time he writes, I'm going to write chapter 24. And he goes and writes chapter 24. Um, yeah, I go to 1% of that detail, if not even. I don't, I don't have an outline on anything like that. I just have some concepts I want to get to. And what for me the juice is is to sit down and it's normally at night. Um, especially with, with young kids when I first started writing, is to let my creativity take hold and not have a a whole predetermined script I have to follow for that chapter. Well, do your characters come to you as you're writing then, or do you have an idea of them also? Uh, as I'm working through the story, like early on when I figure out what my plot's going to be and like kind of which direction I'm going to go, I immediately, my brain will start kind of telling me, of, okay, you're probably going to need, like, you know, for the body man, I knew really early on I was clearly going to have to have a character called the Body Man. Who would that be? At the, the first thing I thought of, um, just to talk about that character for a second, is that you can't have someone with the president or keeping an eye on the office 24 hours a day. So it has to be, at first I thought, well, it's got to be a minimum two-person job. Maybe it's going to be six people. Maybe it's going to be more. But then I didn't really like the the fact that there'd be a lot of people learning a lot of intimate secrets of the office. So what I decided to do at that point, I said, you know, these are two, this is a very complicated job for someone to accept, but this is a two-person role. So you have a body man who's a, um, ultimately responsible for the protection of the office, but you always have an apprentice. And the apprentice is learning the job, and they're kind of do shifts, not a job for the faint at heart, not a job for someone that has a family. Uh, that's kind of outlined in the book when they discuss kind of the role. But I figured out that, okay, you'd have, and then once that a body man steps away, and there, I talk about it more in the book, but once that body man steps away, the apprentice steps in, and a new apprentice is assigned. And so it's kind of this rotation that occurs. Um, so those are those little things that as I'm thinking through the story, I'm immediately thinking, well, I'll need a couple body men. Okay, I'm going to need some FBI characters. How many FBI characters will I need? Will I have other characters that are going to be necessary? So it's kind of just along in the process where, and then as I actually get down to write it a lot of times is when I start thinking through names or really specifics on, you know, a bio kind of on the character. I don't, I've, I've had it before ahead of time, but not always with some of the novels. Well, then what does the role of setting play as you're putting together that plot and those characters? Is it important to you, or is it just something to help move the story along? It's important. What I try to do for setting, um, obviously with something like The Body Man to, as, as our primary example, that's clearly going to have a big setting that takes place in Washington in the Oval Office in the White House. So the setting for there was kind of almost predetermined by the idea of the story. And the Body Man's been out for almost two years now, so I can give out some secrets. But I needed some other settings uh, to take place that were in locations a little bit more, I'd say exotic, but not really. Um, like one of the spots of the story is I need a place that is outside the United States where torture can take place. And so the, the, so the funny part about that is I didn't know where to do it. So I've been fortunate early on in my career, in, in, in a career of not being, you know, a bestseller or any, anything like that, just, you know, a, a writer trying to make it in this, I have gotten to know some bestsellers and gotten phone numbers and contact, and they've been really generous with me. So at one point in particular when I was working on The, the, the Body Man, I had met Brad Taylor several times in New York. I had go down to some of his signings in Charleston, um, and he was very, very supportive, like, if you need anything, you know, had his phone number. So, so I started texting him one day and I was like, okay, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna make this place where the interrogation takes place. Cause I, I'd done research on where, where I could put it. And of course it was, it, the President Obama made black sites illegal, which are, you know, these sites done in other countries where enhanced interrogation and all kinds of stuff happens. But I said, well, if they're going to be illegal, they're still going to happen. So who's going to do them? Well, there's going to be other outfits out there that we can outsource to. Well, where are they going to operate? And I wanted a place close to the continental United States, but obviously, in, you know, outside of our border. 
And I thought, you know, I had read an article just through all my research and stuff of oil platforms, abandoned oil platforms being used in the Gulf for really nefarious purposes. And the first thing I actually read they were used for was for uh, humans uh, trafficking. And that made me think as I was kind of doing research, well, if one was abandoned for long enough or was not checked on often enough, you could use that for uh, – almost a detention center where people were doing torture or something. So actually I reached out to Brad with a few questions. He thought it was a great idea to, to hold the location there. And he was actually helpful where uh, later in the story, when you have to actually extract the body man who's been kidnapped from this location of how do you get him out? And I couldn't think of it for a life of me. And I had a few ideas and I sent him to Brad and he should no, that's not going to work. And he gave me the most, and I won't, I won't spoil it for whoever's not read the book, but he gave me the most simple concept of how you get a team to the oil platform without getting, without raising alarms. That kind of stuff is, you know, when I don't know where it's going to go or how I'm going to uh, facilitate a certain part of the book, that kind of is, again, where the kind of the juice is for me. Of, I have to figure this out, and I, I love that part. All right, so we've talked Body Man, and I do know Eric, and I have a arc of the next, of the novella coming, The, the Ransom Daughter. I just, we'll get to that from plot, but I'm wondering, why did you go from a book to start writing novellas, because I'm thinking about doing the same thing. What was the, what was the mental shift? Like? Yeah, I'd love to say there was some great um, plan in place. Uh, it's kind of uh, circumstances kind of dictated that. So the novella is actually something I had written a while back, and it was rough. So I, I, went, I revisited it earlier this year and kind of redid it, rewrote it with a little bit more experience. But I had changed publishers. I have actually got the rights back to the second book for Breach of Trust, would not be coming out through the same publisher. And I just wanted to put Breach of Trust aside for a while and kind of look at it with fresh eyes. And in the meantime, I kind of knew from a publishing standpoint, you can't let your readers go too long without putting something out. I had three novels on my hard drive that are good stories that needed work, and I had multiple uh, novellas on there. And there were some characters I really loved, and I just spent a lot of time earlier this year looking over that and saying, you know, Ransom Daughter – was a story that was I was really wanted to put out at some point, and this just seemed like it was the right time to introduce uh, my character Troy Evans and his group, which is called the Omega. Yeah. My second novel was a EMP story, and I didn't know anything about EMPs at the time, and I was I was working on that one in 2015, probably is when I was thinking the concept, and I figured if I was ever going to get my door kicked in and a gun put in my face, it would have been then because the the internet's a great thing. And the amount of documents I was looking through and schematics and all that was, first of all, crazy that I could find. But second of all, um, probably got me on a few watch lists. <laughs> well, that's a good place to be. Yeah. Actually. I like being watched. You're being protected at that point, one way or another. When you put together these this, this group of characters, like even back to the body man, and you have these kind of, uh, I don't know, a motley crew of characters that are that are going to go extract the body mat, for instance. It, how do you come up with these characters? Where do they come from? Um, just my fanciful imagination, I guess. Uh, no, <laughs> I'd like to take credit for it, but I probably can't. When I was a younger person, I don't watch as much now, although I do fall in habits of watching. Uh, Joe and I were just talking about this the other night, of spending too much time watching television and not writing. Yeah. I think probably a combination of a lot of the stuff I've watched and read. Um, you know, the other thing, which probably a lot of writers in, in my genre – um, would, would attest to is I got my first Tom Clancy book when I was a teenager. My dad actually gave it to me. I just got immersed in that world. And, and you know, that Clancy started for me, and then I started reading some of the more classic uh, characters that had been written, like Fleming, and st what that Fleming wrote. Um, I wasn't really familiar with it before then, and then that kind of just sparked that interest. And so I've really devoured a lot of that over the years. So when it came time to start writing, which I'll say this, it wasn't something I just picked up in 2014 when I wrote my first novel. I actually started right after college. But the other thing, I'll, I'll break out real quick and just say this thing is, like a lot of people, I started it and I never finished anything. So even to this day, on my computer, I have two folders. One's called books and one's called old books. And that old books is everything prior to 2014 when I started my first full-length novel. And that old books folder probably has a dozen to 16 subfolders and they're all different stories. I started and I did one thing consistently. I never finished anything. And that was kind of the catalyst in 2014 to myself to actually start something and 
put a bow on it. Whether it was published or not, I wanted to finish a novel. And that's kind of my encouragement to people that I keep trying to go back to, especially in podcasts, people that are struggling and they don't know how to start a book or they don't know how to finish a book. There's a lot of things to read to get you to that point. But until you finish something, you can't fix anything. So uh, so for me, when it comes to your question, the characters and all that, a lot of it's just what's kind of what I've experienced in life. I've I've had several friends in the military. One of my one of my good friends is actually my college roommate. Dropped out of college after three years and joined the army. And he was uh, part of fifth group, so I got to go. Uh, I I'd, I'd go out and see him with some frequency. And he'd always bring me back a flag. So he did a lot of deployments. They were part of the Iraq invasion and, and Afghanistan and uh, Syria all over. And he'd bring me back a flag after every time he came back to the states. And so some of those characters, even based on the stories he tells me, especially if it's a military-related character, I kind of use uh, the exploits he shared with me that, that he knew of or, um, or or parts of them. And that's I think where a lot of the characters come from is there. I could never take a character I've written even now and say, oh, well, this part, you know, came from Joe Goldberg and this part, you know, came from Alan Warren or whatever. It's just kind of a conglomerate of all these experiences in life I use to create these characters that I hope readers are going to say, hey, I can relate to that character. Or, hey, that, that character is pretty cool. I want to see what they're going to do next. Or, hey, you just killed the character I liked. So, sorry, I have to do that sometimes. Well, when they're the big stud that knows judo and karate and all that stuff, that, that's got to be after Joe Goldberg. Of, of yeah, course. Right. Of course. Characters. Well, that's why I asked about character because – as one of our previous guests we interviewed once, and I took it to heart, is people remember characters and they forget plots. So Absolutely. they ask a lot of questions about character because it's the most important thing. You, you say Vince Flynn and Mitch Rapp and that, you know that. I can't tell you what book, book seven's plot was, but I remember the character. 100%. And, and Mitch Rapp would be probably the example because I've actually read all the Mitch Rapp novels up to the, the whatever will come out here in a couple of weeks, uh, Kyle's last last Mitch Rapp uh, endeavor. Um, I haven't read all of Tom Clancy, the one that had been done Clancy. I actually haven't read the ones that were done after Clancy died. I think part of that was Clancy to me was on such a, a level as a young person that I didn't want to read other people's interpretations of his characters. And I, and I know some of the guys that write his characters, and they're great writers. I read their other stuff. But I haven't read the Clancy stuff. And I almost did the same with the Mitch Rapp character. Because Mitch, you know, I kind of had my, my thriller, you know, Mount Rushmore. And, and, and Mitch Rapp and, you know, Jack Ryan were kind of like on that Mount Rushmore for me. Or the, or the Especially the authors uh, were. But I picked up the first novel that I think was The Survivors that um, Kyle did uh, after Vince's past. And it felt like Mitch Rapp to me. And I, I wanted to read the next one and the following one. And But I, I completely agree. I couldn't tell you. Many of the Mitch Rapp plots, but I can tell you what Mitch Rapp as a character is like. So, um, so characters definitely, I think, are what ingrained. Because uh, the other thing too with plots is there's a a lot of ways to tell stories, but you know, a lot of times plots are, have at least similar themes to them. No matter what the big bad guy is, there's going to be a big bad guy, and something bad is going to happen to someone good. They're going to lose something. You know, there's a lot of themes that happen through most stories that get reused but characters if you can create a character that really sticks with people you know that's how you can get a career a character can create a career yeah i, I have a, a thing for sherlock holmes where i think he's the greatest character in fiction because people think he's alive and he's lived forever i mean is there anybody better yeah and if you go back and read those books you can see how it developed and he was choppy and all that but why did that character become somebody who People flock to Washington to go find a fictitious house and all these other things. 100%. Actually, when I went to London in 1996, uh, where do you think I went? I went to Baker Street. I wanted, Me too. I wanted to see it. My first time. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, a, that's a great example. And how do you yourself uh, create a character? Are you writing it as if you're the character themselves, or is it like a uh, something that happens at a distance? Like, what what's your own little way of doing this it's definitely not me or i wouldn't sell any books <laughs> i will say that um no it's just that's a good question I, I, you know i i don't know that i have a great answer for it i i try to keep the kick characters different in my head and i actually keep notes i used to do it on a uh, a pad I'd, i actually have a, a working pad or a binder that I would actually have a breakdown of, you know, how, how tall is it? I, I didn't, I don't do, I haven't done this in years, but when I first started the first couple of books, 
Um, and I used the same characters, so I was able to kind of carry a lot of them on for the first two or three books. Um, but I actually would do a, a bio and keep them just so that, you know, you don't want to make every character sound, sound the same. Um, but I, I try to get in their head so I can kind of know their voice. Like, are they sarcastic? And probably many of my characters have a level of sarcasm, which probably is because I'm sarcastic. Uh, can they be immature? Some of them can be kind of immature, probably because I'm kind of immature. So I, in some ways, I probably take some of my personality traits, infuse them into some of the characters. But then there's really smart characters I write, so clearly those aren't me. Of course, of course not. So they're Joe Goldberg, of course. I mean, I'm staying quiet. You, you bring that stuff up. I'm just as a writer, uh, each character has something of you in it usually, and it's some are way more than others. Like so, some you have a, it's a lot of you in it, and some are just a little of you. And of course, I, I thought right away you were the aged neighbor Rose. Um, but which do you think you are <laughs> as a character? I, I, wait, I was the aged neighbor Rose, or Joe was the yeah. aged neighbor? No, I thought for you, sure it was you. I mean, not Eric for sure. I thought you were probably most related to Rose, but maybe not. I, I, it's funny that you picked Rose of all characters because she's actually loosely based on a lady I worked with. <laughs> so I needed a character, and, and actually, she was a lady I would go out and visit in California. Uh, her name was really Rose. Uh, I changed her last name. I told her I was writing a book, and she was just like, oh, yeah, yeah. She, I said, I'll put you in it. Oh, no, you won't. I was like, yes, I will. And so I kind of loosely at least based uh, based Rose on her. No, the character, so, you know, in the body man, yeah, it's kind of hard to get in that head. I'm back in my Troy Evans world since I've been, I'm, I'm focusing on that. I haven't read the body man in almost two years now, a year and a half. So I, I probably am not adequately prepared for which character. The, 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 the protagonist I'm working on now, Troy Evans, I, he shares, he share, I share the passion and feelings he has. Um, when he believes something, he believes it with every fiber of his being. And that's something that's, I've definitely put into that character. We don't have the same belief system necessarily on everything, but if we believe something, uh, we believe it with with all we have and we'll do whatever we have to do to defend it or to stand up for it so you're troy evans yeah i i have a kid so you know troy was on a shelf for several years he's the first character not the first character i ever wrote but the first character i ever finished for a novel and he's the one that after i kind of put those books aside and started the body man and after the body man i started a couple other books after the body man was done part of my I guess I could say my heart has always gone back to, I want to bring Troy out there. That's why I wanted kind of answer Joe's question even indirectly of why, the, why the novella I needed something. I, I think it was best for a career perspective to, to not make my readers wait so long till almost you know two and a half years between books. So I wanted to put something out and I wanted to put Troy out for years. Um, and I'm putting it out myself. I, I created, you know, created my own imprint. Uh, so that, that's taken me a good chunk of the year just to, to learn the, and I knew a lot of the business side that I've been learning with having that ability to put something out on my own. I wanted, I, I thought this was the right time to actually bring Troy into the world. And he, he's not a simple character by any stretch, but he's passionate character. And, and he's one of those people that if he's in your corner, if you've convinced him that this is the right decision, uh, he'll die for you. He'll, he'll take he'll take a bullet to make sure that that happens, or he dies trying to make it happen. And and but the other thing too about him that I like, and and when I wrote him from the get go, is I have a lot of like I've talked about, um, you know, the Jack Ryan books, the Mitch Rack rap series. Um, I love those characters, and I, and the, the 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 folks that wrote those characters are doing a gr- have done a great job. But one thing over the years was I didn't like the fact that a lot of these um big protagonists out there are kind of immortal. You know, they can get shot, they can get thrown off a helicopter, they can get dropped off a building. It's kind of like John Wick in, in John Wick 4. They're going to pop back up, and, and sometimes they're popping back up in an action scene the next chapter. I didn't want to write that. I, I didn't want to have a character that was bulletproof. I wanted a character that if he's going to get shot, um, I'll do it if I have to in the right time, but, man, that's going to put him out of commission, not, not just for, you know, you know, a half a day where he has to, you know, take a little break. So. Right. You're going to make him real. Um, exactly. You know, relative to uh, how, how, how it happens, someone gets shot and, and that they feel it. It's not just, uh, you know, they're walking in the room the next day and they're all fine. Right. And that's one way I was going to say, that's one way probably my books are set apart too, 
is I try to do a good mixture, and I hope hope I find a balance with everything I write of having action, but also the storyline and the plot. I, I at least as I've gotten older, I'm in my mid forties now, getting getting closer to my later forties, I guess, push pushing later forties. Right, um, your child. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I don't feel like a child, but thank you. I don't want nonstop action when I'm reading. It actually doesn't turn me off, but the, it's not the books I gravitate towards anymore. It's just every chapter just hitting harder and harder and harder. So that's definitely been reflective in my writing of I sprinkle in the action because I enjoy it, but I want there to be a plot that's driving the narrative, not just one explosion and one gunfight after another. I tire of it personally and other people devour it. And I respect that. That's just not where I'm at now. So that, that leads me to uh, what's the uh, theme or the idea behind your stories. Like, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of action, and in quite a few of the thriller writers, there's a lot of action. But you're saying you've got a plot and you've got a little bit more story, I guess. I don't, I, I don't know how to say that, but you've kind of got more of a story going on. So is there a theme underlying? Is there some sort of, even if it come out organically in the story, is there some sort of a meaning? Yeah, it, it, yes. So each one... It... Each book does not necessarily have a like, – I know some authors will have a specific theme for each book, and I've ne- I don't ever go into the book with that intention, but it normally ends up coming out during the course of the story. Like for, for my Troy Evans character, um, just taking him back, because the novella is a small portion of him. Um, it's, since it's a smaller story, um, you'll see a lot more of him in the book that comes out next year, um, which I'm tentatively going to call the Omega Group. I'm going to name it after the uh, the name of the, um, the, the the group the guys work under. But the first novel I did with him was called Vengeance. Um, and it, it literally, the beginning of the boy, uh, story is a story about vengeance. And there's, there's multiple themes going on uh, that tie into a story of vengeance. But vengeance to me, when I was writing it, was very kind of almost anticlimactic. I thought, man, if this story is about vengeance – and all you got is a character, and he's just trying to get revenge for something that happened, at least in my mind, if we get to the end of that, he's going to find it very empty feeling if he gets his vengeance. So what I wanted to make that story about when I started it was the name was Vengeance. The concept that started the story was Vengeance, but it was actually a story about redemption. And especially for Troy, I, I try to put him in the, in the other novels I wrote, um, I'm trying to bring him with each story to a place where um, not his beliefs change, his core beliefs never change. The, w- the way he looks at things and the way his perception is ends up changing. Maybe I didn't see all the other sides, which, you know, I, I think that's we just we, I know we're talking offline about politics and politics is a bad thing to talk about. But I, I think that's where, especially for the United States at this point. If people could stop looking at left, right, stop just being caught in the bog of, well, I don't agree with that person said. And if they found a core value, which I think there are core values that the majority, not everyone will share anything, but the majority of people, if, if you could find those core values, um, I think you'd look at your fellow human being and say, well, we're not actually that different. Well, yeah, well, do we disagree on stuff? Absolutely. But we're not actually that different. And, and, and I try to get that with my characters where they're, you know, they're headstrong going into something thinking, well, this is what I believe. Well, in the course of those stories, they're like, well, maybe there's more than one way to get to an end. Maybe maybe there's more than just my perspective as well. So that's, that's what I've tried to do. So there's there's not a not a written theme. Like I think a, a per, I think a good example would probably be Jack Carr. I've, I've uh, know Jack and I've I've read a lot, I've watched a lot of his interviews over the years and and stuff. And he'll he'll actually have like a two to five word, whatever, um, uh, paragraph or not paragraph statement that he'll have on a sticky note or whatever. And that's kind of what's driving, you know, whether it's, you know, something without remorse or revenge or whatever, something that's driving that narrative. Um, I don't go to that level with it, but I think at the end it ends up flushing out that there is an overall theme that occurs with, with each of the stories. Well, how does it different to get those themes and character development? When you, it's different when you have 100,000 words versus 35,000 words. How how'd you find it differently when you had a very more, much more compact space to do that all in? Yeah, it just had to be, it had to be a lot. So I had to do more with less. With Ransom Daughter, yeah, it's, it's, I'm literally just finishing, it's already been professionally edited and everything. And I'm kind of, 
I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. I was working on it last night and I'll work on it tonight. I'm kind of going through the edits one more time. Okay. Is there something I missed? Is there something the editor didn't catch before I uh, order some more advanced copies to send out to, uh, um, to some reviewers and stuff? I just had to make it very much you know, you, with a hundred thousand word narrative uh, story or 90 to a hundred thousand word. You can put a little bit more fluff in there, a little bit more background, all that. With Ransom Daughter, you know, there's not much of that. So I just had to get, it's not action packed from first page to last or, you know, every page between their action packed, but the story itself had to be very tight, very succinct. It's, you know, it's just what it sounds like. It's a Ransom Daughter. So that, you know, the beginning of the story starts and you have a young girl that's been taken. And, you know, this is an abduction that you immediately find out is for money. Uh, which, you know, as, as a father, I have a daughter, I have a son. Um, you know, it raises some questions of what would you do, you know, to protect those you love? And in, in this particular story, the father's very wealthy. He was, um, he, he had won and lost many fortunes, but he came out on top and hit it big in the oil fields in Texas and sold out. So, um, his older children, kind of had to pay their own college and they kind of had it rough. Well, his, his oops child, his last child, his daughter, she grew up with money. So money wasn't an issue. So when this ransom takes place and, and, you know, he's told to pay the money, you know, kind of the no brainer is he's got the money to pay, but maybe paying the money isn't the right answer. Um, and you know, he's also warned you can't go to authorities. Um, you know, kind of given some list of do's and don'ts. One of them is just basically pay the money or your daughter is going to perish. And he decides to go a different direction with it. Let's her perish. <laughs> of course. I mean, yeah. why would she, you know, he, yes. he, he's got a lot of money. He can just have another child. It's fine. Yeah. Just, just go by. He's it. got the older ones. He'll be fine. Yeah. He's got the older ones. What did you have to change or what did you feel you had to change? in this original story to make it publishable? I just had to tighten it up. So when I wrote this several years back, I, I grew as a writer. Joe has the uh, fortune of not having probably read my earlier stuff. And so I, I think I had good plot lines to start with. I had kind of good stuff, but I didn't know how to say the things I needed to say. I think I rambled on a lot. I know I did a lot of head hopping. I did all the things that uh, the, the, the agents and publishers will tell you. If you want to get published, you can't do this. So this one wasn't too bad because it wasn't, it was a small, it was a smaller story. So it wasn't having to reinvent the wheel, but I just had to fix a lot of my things. And just as I had developed the last couple of years, especially with the body man and breach of trust, which is the follow up to the body man. After those two stories, I had just kind of figured out my voice a little better, I think, um, and how I told the stories. So I had to, make sure that that same voice was kind of put in, into Ransom Daughter. That it was, it was, the story has remained the same, but how I told it, I had to, had to do a, I had to do a fair amount of change. Um, I, I think I added, I'm trying to remember what it was when I started it in January, February. I think it was probably in the high, tw- high mid to high 20s. So I probably did add about 10,000 words. But part of that was because I think I, le- I had a lot of several sections where, um, I just left things hanging. You know, I kind of didn't give the readers enough of a reason to turn to the next page. And that, that's one thing that I learned early on, um, early on with the body man, trying to get a, a publisher and trying to get an agent and everything with that was I just kept, le- I've kept learning all along. But one of them is don't give the readers a reason to put the book down. You know, you want, you want to be able to write something so that they do stay up at night and they, they flip to the next chapter. They don't go, okay, I'm done for the night. I'm, no, you want them to go read the next chapter. You want to end on a, you know, on a, on a, not a cliffhanger every chapter, but a reason for them to turn the chapter, turn the page to the next chapter, hopefully before they even go to bed, which I didn't normally do that way. I would leave it more of, you know, and he had to do this and uh, okay. Well, that's not, a, you know, so I, I had to turn it more into a dramatic, Give them a good reason to turn the page. Um, so I definitely had to do that with this one. So you keep the reader awake all night, and then they're grouchy when they get to work the next day because of you. They're Joe Goldberg the next day, yes. Yeah, they'll, they'll blame you in the review. This book kept me up all night long. I'm really yeah. tired, you know. <laughs> I'm tired. That's, you know, what? As long as they leave the review, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it'll be a one star. I got tired reading this book, staying up all yeah. night reading it, turning every page. You'll go never go, get to go sleep away. reading this. Book. <laughs> Read Joe's book if you want to. Get yeah, you my book. I, I'm I actually. Yeah, I am fighting that right now on the going through the last drafts of Devil's Own Day. It's uh, 
beginnings and endings of chapters. You know, set the say, set the scene, and don't give them a reason. To put the book down. Every chapter, and I get, that's the one thing I've been focusing on, like a hawk. Hence, it's a easy to get lazy. Yeah, absolutely. Doing those things. Well, I, yeah. I, I think Joe would probably agree with this too. Is we kind of, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. But we, Joe and I find ourselves in a world where. You've got really, really good writers. They're doing such a great job that you have to compete. You have to put together a good book where I'm not knocking it saying 30 years ago you could dial it in, but you didn't have the level of competition. You know, you didn't have, you didn't have Amazon KDP. You didn't have all the things that are out there now, which in many ways are blessings. But if you're trying to build an audience, in many ways they're a curse because, you know, people have thousands of other people they can just grab one of their books. So, you know, what sets you apart? Well, your, your writing has to set you apart. Your character has to set you apart. Um, and yeah, you've got to build, you've got e- each chapter has to stand on its own and you can't just have a filler chapter that's keeping people going from 31, uh, 32 to 33. You know, oh, you could skip 32. No, you, you got to make it so that you can't skip chapter 32. That's an integral part and that's keeping the readers, you know, moving forward. So let's talk about that. How do you interact with readers or do you? Is there social media, website, bars? Where, where do people find you? You know, strange women at bars, but not, not readers very often. So I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, even they can read too. Some of them. <laughs> some of them, yes. <laughs> um, no, actually, you know, that's a joke because re- uh, female readers are, that's the biggest demographic, really. Um, even for thrillers, um, you know, females love, uh, you know, they, I think the years ago, at least the stereotype would be, oh, a woman wants to read a, read a romance novel. Yeah, maybe years ago, but not the case now. You know, women are extremely sharp readers, very, uh, very intuitive on picking up on thrillers and, and what works and what doesn't work. So, so Joe knows what one thing that I learned early on, Alan, is um, when I'd written that first novel, which uh, Vengeance in 2014, you know, I, I thought I was, you know, I thought I was on easy street. Hey, I wrote a novel. Someone's going to publish it and I quit my day job at some point. And then the rejection started and the rejections happened. It happened for many years, but those first two years, a lot of rejections happened. And finally, one of the agents actually got back to me and with uh, the story and they said, you know, not a bad story. I think you got a lot of promise here. Um, what's your social media presence? And so I, re- I emailed back this author or this agent, and I was like, social media, that's for suckers. What do you, what do people do social media for? And they were kind of like, when you have 10,000 Twitter followers, email me back. When you have a website that's getting, you know, traffic, email me back. And so 2016 is when, I, I think January of 2016 is when I actually started uh, building the social media platform um, and using, you know, all the major ones over the course of the last several years for sure. But yeah, that's, that's the best. Again, it's a blessing and a curse. It's the best way to interact and to find new readers. But unfortunately, all those moments you spend on Twitter or Facebook or threads or TikTok or Instagram, those are minutes you're not writing a book. So that's the downside on it. But you, you, we're at a place now in the, uh, the, the, pu- the publishing world where it doesn't matter who you are, you have to have a presence or you have to pay for someone that acts like they're your presence. Like Joe Goldberg does not post yeah, yeah, his own stuff. Yeah, he's got No, he's, uh, yeah. he's, no, he's got people running his. This know, isn't, yeah, I got people. This isn't I Joe Goldberg people. talking. This is, this is, no, this is AI yeah. Joe Goldberg. Yeah, this is <laughs> chat, <laughs> chat J-O-E. Well, yeah, yeah, he's, he's actually a little smarter though. <laughs> oh. Yes. Oh. Can't argue with that. I mean, I mean, I. <laughs> oh, I, I like you, Alan. Terrible. You're a great guy. If that's not been said yet, you're wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Social media is definitely the way to interact with fans. Um, you know, it's funny. Just and obviously, I'm hyping up promotion because the Ransom Daughter will be out on October 10th. But uh, today would be an example of doing the pu- doing the radio show with you, uh, recording this, um, doing Instagram Live later. And then another podcast after. It's just, it, it stacked up, you know, just the way scheduling happened after work and everything. But, uh, um, but yeah, it ends up taking up. I enjoy it. You know, to me, to me, it'd be a lot harder if you were a writer and really detested communicating with people, uh, through these kind of mediums. That would be a lot harder. I do enjoy it. Um, I will say, but it, it's definitely, it makes it harder to get novels done for sure. Well, you know, it's better in some ways. You don't have to leave your home. You don't have to go out and 
and uh, do as many uh, appearances when you have social media. So it's kind of good in that sense. One hundred percent. And, uh, you know, that's one thing that obviously COVID restrictions and just what happened for, you know, 18 months, two years was that a lot of that type of stuff obviously just happened via remote uh, capability through Zoom, you know, what we're talking on now. And I'm sure the publishers in some ways appreciated it. And there's, it's one of those things where to have that face to face and have an author come to your bookstore or come to your library or whatever, I do think that there is a value in that. But on the other side is you can reach a lot of people by using these mediums as well. And you don't have to worry about plane flights and hotels and all the other things. So there, there's the financial savings of being able to do this. And, and you can clearly like something on the, you know, the, the, with the NBC radio program, you can reach a lot of, a, a lot of audience with just having the ability to talk on this platform. Yeah. And you don't have to wear pants. I'm not. <laughs> well, there you have it. We had the body man with no pants. We couldn't do that live. The lower body man. The lower body. It would be just the upper body man, actually. So. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. the upper body man. There you go. Al prefers the lower body man. Well, generally, yeah. But, you know, hey, you never know. J- J- Joe's going below the belt on that one. I don't know about that. Oh, <laughs> oh. Up. All right. You're bad connection here. Time's up. Have a nice yeah. day. <laughs> well, okay. So let's get this. So what is your website now? We'll get it up for people and have people find you. Yeah, awesome. So my website is my name, ericpbishop.com. The, the P in the middle is my middle initial, at Paul, actually. So you could think of the Beatle or the Apostle, but ericpbishop.com is where they can find me. Fantastic. We'll have that up, of course. People can find it one click easily. With the latest book coming out in October will be, what's it called? Ransom Daughter, a Troy Evans novella. And you're going to keep going with Troy in the future and kind of go back to the body man? Is that how you're going to do it? Yeah, so... As of right now, I'll come out with two. I've got two completed books that they need uh, professional editing and all the other things that you have to do to put it out, um, which will start in the uh, after I finish up the promo for Ransom Daughter. But so next year, um, the first thing that will come out earlier will be uh, Breach of Trust, which is the follow up to the Body Man series. And then later in the year, I'll come out with what I'm tentatively titling the Omega Group right now, which it's not the follow up to Ransom Daughter, but it's a continuation of those characters. And, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try for a period of time. We'll see how, how long I keep my sanity. I'm going to try to maintain uh, those two uh, stories going. And then I'm, I'm working on a couple other. The, the Body Man world, which I really feel like I kind of created some characters, and I designed it that way so that they could have some offshoots. Like um, Eli and Kat are the FBI agents in the Body Man. And, I, I mean, I even leave the last chapter. The end of the book is kind of a – them getting ready to go, uh, you know, they get a phone call and, you know, there's there's a case, there's something for them to do. Well, that is its own novel, which I started, but I didn't get very far. It got put aside with all the other promotion and everything else I've been working on the last year and a half. But um, but I have a story for several of those characters, and, I, you know, I'd kind of like to take these books and, you know, intertwine them, you know, these different characters and just ha- have, have a world created, and hopefully the readers will, will join me and enjoy enjoy what's been what's been done. Well, fantastic. We appreciate you being on the show. Uh, Eric P. Bishop, thanks a lot. Thanks, Alan. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Joe. Here, yeah, Eric. Bye. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.